You're about to take a complete practice test for the TOEFL IBT listening section. My name's Josh, I'm from TST Prep, and there are a couple of differences between this test and the actual TOEFL. So the first difference is that on test day, you're in control of your time. So if you wanna just take five seconds to answer a question, or you wanna take a minute to answer a question, it's up to you. But for this practice on YouTube, each question has the same length of time for you to complete. So keep that in mind. The second thing is that there is a link in the description below to a PDF with explanations for all of the answers. So if you need more explanation for why something is correct or incorrect, definitely check that out. Also, you'll see all the answers in the description. So again, answers are in the description. And if you need more help with courses, classes, more practice questions, check out tscprep.com. Use coupon code tscprep-josh for 10% off. But that's it. Hope you guys find this helpful. Good luck, test takers. And I will see you at the end. Now listen to a conversation between a student and a professor. Good morning, Professor Jacobs. How was your weekend? Hi, Jane. My weekend was great. Very relaxing. How about yours? I had a blast. I went to an exhibition at a gallery in the city, and one of the artists was there. I got to meet him. Unfortunately, I don't remember his name, but he does drip art just like Jackson Pollock. It was really cool and inspiring to meet someone who creates art for a living. Wow, what an exciting weekend. And it sounds like you really have found some inspiration for your drip art project. How is that coming along? Well, that's kind of what I wanted to talk to you about. I think drip art is really unique and interesting, but I'm having trouble with the assignment. Well, what seems to be the problem? I started working on the project right after going to the exhibit but I feel like I'm stuck and I'm worried I won't be able to create a piece that I'm comfortable handing in. How so? Are you confused about the assignment? I think I understand the assignment well, but you know how you always tell us to express ourselves in our art? That's why I feel frustrated with this project. I feel like I'm forcing myself to create something and it just feels fake. What would you do if you were in my shoes? I completely understand your concern, but that's the whole point of my class. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. Let go and try something new. Okay, I'll give it another shot today, and I'll see if I can push past the feeling of being stuck. That's a good idea. And if you're still feeling uneasy, I'm having a workshop this Saturday, and you can join it if you like. You can see some examples of drip art and watch the actual process. That may be really helpful for you. If you stay for a little while afterward, we can discuss any further questions you may have. That sounds great. Thank you so much. I would love to attend the workshop. I think that it's just what I need to help me finish this project. You're welcome. I'm glad you stopped by. I'd rather you be confused and ask questions than say nothing and struggle with the project. I'll see you on Saturday. Now, answer the questions. 1. Why does the student want to talk to the professor? 2. What does the student mean when she says the assignment feels fake? 3. Listen again to part of the passage. Why does the professor say this? I completely understand your concern, but that's the whole point of my class. I want you to get out of your comfort zone. Let go and try something new.
Four, what suggestions does the professor make to the student? Select two. Five, why does the professor suggest this student attend his workshop? Now listen to part of a talk in an economics class. Today we're going to be discussing public goods. So basically, lots of individuals and businesses create new ideas and products every day, and most expect to get some money from their creations. But what happens when you make something that has such a tremendous benefit to society that you can't expect to receive any money in return? This kind of good is a public good. Can anyone think of examples of a public good? Well, I'm not so sure, but maybe some of the TV channels on basic cable. I mean, anyone with a TV and an antenna can get some channels to watch. Yes, I didn't think of that before. But you're right, Sam. Basic cable channels are a public good. Another example might be a country's national defense or military. These exist purely to benefit the people. Professor, is there any way to kind of judge whether a product is a public or private good? I mean, like those TV channels, they might be free, but you still need to buy a TV. So I guess I'm just not sure how you can tell if something is a public good. Yes, this idea can be a bit confusing. I guess it's best to contrast it with a private good, say a piece of pizza. A piece of pizza can be bought and sold pretty easily. And one of the reasons why is because it's so easy to separate. I suppose one of the most defining characteristics of public goods is that they are almost impossible to separate. TV airways and the national defense system are not things you can really break down into pieces. It's the same with public Wi-Fi. Many cities are now offering free Wi-Fi to residents. Wi-Fi only exists in the air. You can't hold Wi-Fi and separate it into pieces. Oh, okay, professor. I think I get it now. But in the book, they mention the terms non-excludable and non-rivalrous when trying to explain public goods, and I didn't really get it. Great. I was just going to get to that. So, besides being hard to separate, economists usually classify something as a public good if it is both non-excludable and non-rivalrous. Now, I know these terms are quite a mouthful, but they are fairly simple ideas. Let's start with non-excludable. Non-excludable means that it is either expensive or nearly impossible to exclude someone from using the good. Uh, let's say an individual, who we will call Larry, buys a private good like a piece of pizza. Then he can exclude others from eating that pizza. However, if national defense is being provided, then it includes everyone. If you strongly disagree with your country's defense policies, the national defense still protects you. You cannot choose to be unprotected, and national defense cannot protect everyone else and exclude you. The second main characteristic of a public good is that it is non-rivalrous, which means that when one person uses the public good, another can also use it. With a private good like pizza, if our subject Larry is eating the pizza, then another person cannot eat it. That is, the two people are rivals in consumption. With a public good like national defense, Larry's consumption of national defense does not reduce the amount for others, so they are non-rivalrous in this area. A number of government services are also examples of public goods. For instance, it would not be easy to provide fire and police service for some people in a given neighborhood, but not everyone. 
Protecting some necessarily means protecting others too. Paying for public goods is always a challenging dilemma for both business leaders and politicians. The key insight in paying for public goods is to find a way of assuring that everyone will make a contribution. For example, if people come together through the political process and agree to pay taxes and make group decisions about the quantity of public goods, then they can all feel like they are being treated equally because everyone contributes. Now, answer the questions. 1. What is the lecture mainly about? Two, how is the lecture organized? Three, based on the information from the listening, indicate which characteristic on the left belongs to either non-excludable, non-rival, or neither. This question is worth two points. Four, what is an example of a public good? Select two. Five, what is the professor implying when she says this? So besides being hard to separate, economists usually classify something as a public good if it is both non-excludable and non-rivalrous. Now, I know these terms are quite a mouthful, but they are fairly simple ideas. Six, why does the professor talk about pizza during the lecture? Now listen to part of a talk in a psychology class. Now that we're on the topic of memory, it's a good time to talk about the case of Henry Mollison. Okay, so where to start? Well, Henry Mollison was better known as H.M. in the scientific community. You see, he is probably, no, definitely, the most important patient 
in the history of neuroscience. Before his death in 2008, Mullison was the subject of over 1,200 research articles. So, what made H.M. so special? Well, a little background about his life. Mollison had epilepsy, which is when you lose control of much of your body and start having seizures. Well, by the age of 27, H.M.'s seizures were getting much worse. In an attempt to control his seizures, H.M. underwent brain surgery to remove very important pieces of his brain, his hippocampus and his amygdala. Now, I'll put that on the board here. So, the doctor in charge of this procedure believed it would cure his epilepsy. Well, he was right in that H.M.'s seizures almost completely stopped. But, there was an even more drastic and devastating consequence of this procedure. Mollison lost his ability to create new memories. This is referred to in medical terminology as severe anterograde amnesia, and I'll put that on the board too. You see, Henry no longer had the ability to make conscious memories of specific facts like names, dates, and recent happenings. So, if you introduced yourself to Henry at any time after the surgery, within 30 seconds of your introduction, he would completely forget ever meeting you. H.M. would wake up every day in the same state of mind he had before the surgery. He could not make any new conscious memories. In 1962, about 10 years after his surgery, a young surgeon named Suzanne Corkin met H.M. and realized that, while a tragedy in most respects, H.M.'s condition provided her with a unique opportunity to analyze the function of specific areas of the brain and how they relate to learning and memory. Even though he suffered from amnesia, much of Henry's brain function besides memory remained intact. He was a friendly guy. Also, since he had almost no short-term memory ability, he would never get tired of the boring brain activities needed for the research. Studying H.M.'s brain led to some fascinating discoveries in the field of neuroscience. Up until the 20th century, neuroscience had very little understanding of how the brain worked. H.M.'s rewired brain quickly proved that memory was not spread throughout the brain. Henry's acute anterograde amnesia had little effect on his self-knowledge or intelligence prior to the age of 25. Henry's case and others like it soon revealed that declarative long-term memories are stored in the area of the brain known as the hippocampus. Through HM, researchers discovered that the brain possesses multiple systems for storing and retrieving memories that are dispersed in different but specific locations in the brain. HM could not form any new conscious memories after his surgery, but he could improve on his ability to perform tasks. It soon became clear that the brain had another type of memory system, called muscle memory, which did not rely on conscious memories. In one of her experiments, Corkin would have H.M. sketch a figure through the reflection of a mirror. This is a challenging task that takes time to practice and master. Mollison had developed a new skill subconsciously through repetition. Sometimes referred to as motor learning, H.M. confirmed that new skills can be learned through repetition over time disassociated from conscious memories. This doesn't mean that skills like playing the piano or drawing a face rely solely on muscle memory. However, it plays a much bigger role in our retention of skills than previously suspected. While there were some benefits for research, Henry's unique amnesia made it almost impossible for him to remember any new events after the surgery. For example, the death of his parents occurred later in his life, and he couldn't remember it. Whenever he was reminded of his parents' demise, the pain returned as if he were hearing it again for the first time. Now, answer the questions. One. What is the lecture mainly about?
2. How does the professor organize the lecture? Three, what does the professor imply about Henry Mollison's situation? Four, after his surgery, why would Henry Mollison forget about meeting someone 30 seconds later? Five, how is Henry Mollison able to develop new skills? Six, why does the professor say this? In an attempt to control his seizures, H.M. underwent brain surgery to remove very important pieces of his brain, his hippocampus and his amygdala. Now I'll put that on the board here. Now listen to a conversation between a student and an IT worker. Hi, I have a big problem that I need your help with. What's going on? Well, I was just at the library to print some stuff off for class, and when I went to open my laptop and get started, the screen went blank, and all these funny symbols started showing up. Then my computer just turned off. I don't know what to do. My computer won't turn back on. I'm scared that something bad happened, like a virus, or it crashed. Oh dear, that sounds like a potential virus to me. Let me take a look at your computer so I can try and scan and find the problem. Did you back up your work? You know what? It's really weird, but I actually just backed up everything this morning onto my external hard drive, which I haven't done in a really long time. It's like I just had a feeling something was going to happen, and now I can't believe that something actually is wrong. That's really lucky that you backed everything up, because in this situation, who knows if you'll be able to get everything back. It will take time for me to scan it and see what's the problem. Hopefully I won't have to, but I may need to clean the hard drive, in which case you would lose any information on your computer. If you prefer, you can take it to the company where you bought your computer and have them take a look, but that could cost you at least $500. That's crazy. I trust you, though, and I think whatever you decide is best. That's what I'll do. I don't want to spend $500 if they're just going to tell me the same thing you would. Okay, I'll go ahead and keep your computer here, and I'll send you an email when the scan is done, and I'll find out what's going on and what can be done to fix it. Do you know how long that's going to take? I still need to print some files for class. 
Well, I can't say for sure, but I think you should take your external hard drive to the library and print your files off at the library computers in the meantime. Besides, if I have to swipe your hard drive, there won't be anything on your laptop to print. That's true. Well, at least that fire's put out. Now, I just have to worry about my computer getting back to normal. Now, answer the questions. 1. What problem is the student having? 2. What does the IT worker imply when she tells the student he is lucky that he backed up his files? Three, listen again to part of the passage. What does the student mean when he says this? That's true. Well, at least that fire's put out. Now, I just have to worry about my computer getting back to normal. Four, listen again to part of the passage. What does the IT worker imply when she says this? If you prefer, you can take it to the company where you bought your computer and have them take a look, but that could cost you at least $500. Five, when will the IT worker be done fixing the student's computer? Now listen to part of a talk in a sociology class. Today we are going to discuss marriage, and more importantly, we want to study how the idea of marriage interacts with the society as a whole. In other words, we want to know how observing marriages in different cultures can help us learn a bit more about the larger community. So, when we sociologists want to study families, we must first have a perspective. Um, a kind of lens to look through. You might remember from the reading the idea of functionalism. In sociology, functionalism is when you look at a society and individuals within a society as filling a role or a function. They have to serve some purpose. Let's use this lens, the perspective of functionalism, to examine marriage. When considering the role of families in societies, Functionalists believe that they play a key role in stabilizing the culture. The family performs certain tasks that help a society grow and develop. After a series of tests, 
sociologist George Murdoch has determined that there are three universal functions of the family, sexual, reproductive, and educational. According to Murdoch, the family, which for him includes the state of marriage, regulates sexual relations between individuals. He does not deny the existence of sex outside of marriage, but states that the family offers a socially approved sexual outlet for adults. This outlet gives way to reproduction, which is a necessary part of ensuring the survival of society. Once children are produced, the family plays a vital role in training them for adult life. The family teaches young children the ways of thinking and behaving that follow social and cultural values and beliefs. Basically, parents teach their children how to be good citizens in a given culture. But that's just the functional perspective. There are other lenses to look through. Conflict theory looks at a society as a constant state of fighting, since two individuals, families, governments, and so on are competing for a limited number of resources. Conflict theorists are quick to point out that American families have a more individualistic style of thinking. Many Americans are resistant to government intervention in the family. Parents do not want the government to tell them how to raise their children or to become involved in domestic issues. Conflict theory highlights the role of power in family life and that individuals within families are constantly struggling for control. Let's look at the division of labor within the family home as an example. Most family members don't get paid for washing dishes and vacuuming carpets. However, studies indicate that when men do more housework, women experience more satisfaction in their marriages, reducing the incidence of conflict and increasing the woman's power. In general, conflict theorists tend to study areas of marriage and life that involve inequalities in power and authority, as they are reflective of the larger social structure. Now, there is one more popular lens that many sociologists look through, and that's symbolic interactionism. Interactionists view the world in terms of symbols and the meanings assigned to them. The family itself is a symbol. To some, it is a father, mother, and children. To others, it's any union that involves respect and compassion. Interactionists stress that family is a social phenomenon that changes meaning based on the time, place, and culture. Consider what it means to be a father or a mother. At one time, it was a symbol of biological connection to a child. However, many children now are no longer raised by their biological parents, but still call them mother and father. Interactionists also realize how the roles within families are socially constructed. Interactionists view the family as a group of role players, or actors, that come together to act out their parts in an effort to construct a family. These roles are up for interpretation. Now, just to recap, if we view the family through a functional lens, then we see actions based on how it contributes to a society as a whole. If we look through a conflict theory lens, then we see family interactions as a power struggle between individuals. And if we look through the symbolic interactionist lens, then we view the actions of families as filling a role they are expected to play, and that role can change over time. Which one do you think is the most useful perspective to have on contemporary American marriages? Now, answer the questions. 1. What is the lecture mainly about? 2. Why does the professor discuss sociologist George Murdoch? 3. How is the lecture organized? 
4, the professor discusses several perspectives on marriage and family unit. Indicate which information matches each type of perspective. This question is worth two points. Five, according to sociologist George Murdoch, what are the three universal functions of the family? Six. Why does the professor say this? Which one do you think is the most useful perspective to have on contemporary American marriages? All right, congratulations, you've made it to the end. Good job, this TOEFL stuff is hard. A million other things you could be doing, so be proud of yourself. And we have to keep going though. So you're only halfway done. There's another section, the speaking section, which I'll link to right here. Be sure to check that out. If you need more help, check out tsdprep.com for teachers, courses, classes, and practice. All right, good luck everybody. Thank you for watching, and I will see you in the next one.